Welcome to the live Q&A vlog for June 2021. Uh, thank you for joining in and uh, please uh, feel free to start leaving comments if you have any questions you'd like me to answer. Uh, I suppose I should say the normal things at the beginning of a video, uh, like if you enjoy this video, please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button. Uh, also, um, if you enjoy vlogs like this one, then please consider uh, supporting the Patreon campaign. Um, I do consider vlogs like this to be directly supported by the campaign, and you can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. Uh, I should also mention that if you prefer to listen to vlogs like this, then you can uh, search for the John Gets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. And uh, yeah, on that note, I think it's time to start this vlog off. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I am doing something new uh, this month where I'm going to have the chat actually on screen. Um, so please let me know if you have any um, uh, feedback about how that is. Already I'm thinking the text is a little bit small, but we're going to roll with it for this one. And uh, yeah, please let me know feedback when it comes to that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Arif says, hello from the UAE. What was the last uh, genre that you were surprised that you liked before Cube Rails games? Um, hmm. That's an interesting question. It's really hard to think back <laughs> to the last year. Everything has been so kind of smushed together. Um, honestly, nothing is coming to mind. <laughs> I hate to give you a really uh, dull answer like that. I've been so focused on Euro style games for years. And when I think back to my favorite games from last year, that is still the case. Um, like essentially all of the games on my top 10 list for last year were Euro style games. And it would not surprise me if a top 10 list for 2021 has some cube rails type stuff on it that will mix the Euro up. Um, if I come up with a uh, thought that answers that a little bit better then uh, I will let you know. But right now I think, um, you know, the reason that I've been so blown away by the cube rails thing is because it came out of left field and because I've been kind of comfortable where um, I've been <laughs> for so many years now, uh, about 13 years ago, whatever, uh, 2008, uh, when I first really started getting into board games, uh, that is um, a time of huge experimentation. I was trying all sorts of stuff, social deduction. I played Age of Steam, I think in 2009, and it was, uh, I don't really remember much about it, but I don't remember enjoying the experience. I think it was a bit overwhelming uh, for somebody who was so new to the hobby. And yeah, for the first like three or four years, I played just about anything anyone would bring to to a, uh, a game day. And from that, I kind of figured out what my tastes were. And I think realistically from 2012 or so and on, um, I've been a Euro gamer uh, primarily. Um, I, I've always been somewhat fascinated by smaller stuff like uh, uh, specifically small card games and the like, but um, I've really just gone down a whole bunch of Euro gaming alleys to figure out what I like in that space as well. And for a lot of that time, it's been engine building. So this is a long way of saying <laughs> it's it's tough to say. Maybe the, the, the last genre that surprised me was Euro games <laughs> back like uh, uh, 10 or 11 years ago um, when I realized that it could be a lot of fun um, just, you know, pushing cubes around and uh, getting a whole bunch of uh, resources and whatnot. Uh, I, I really realized that I enjoyed building things in front of myself, tableau building, um, as um, this all went on, as I experimented with more and more things. And yeah, I, I kind of uh, ended up very set in my ways. And because of that, I actually avoided playing things with stocks and auctions and that kind of thing uh, for quite some time. And uh, I'm glad I decided to change that up. <laughs> I'm glad I decided to experiment around. And honestly, this has me thinking about other ideas, um, like um, uh, war games, for example. Um, I have um, just kind of assumed that I didn't like war games for essentially my entire board gaming life. Um, and that's because in the past when I've done uh, played some games with troops on a map, it hasn't really done much for me. But after the cube rails thing, it has me wondering... Maybe I should give Wargaming a try. Uh, and maybe not the big stuff. Uh, in particular, Hollenspiel is a uh, publisher who does print-on-demand stuff, and they have a couple of Cube Rails games. And they also primarily, I think, do war games. And there's one in particular called Brave Little Belgium, which I keep almost buying because it's supposedly like a really good introduction to wargaming. And I kind of want to try it uh, just to see if maybe this is something else that I would like. Uh, I definitely uh, have come away from this feeling like I should maybe experiment a little little bit more and not be so stuck in my ways. Uh, Travis is here and he says, have you had a chance to play Oath yet? 
Uh, no, no, I haven't. Oath is the new big box game that's coming out from Letter Games, and it's kind of like a, not really a sequel to Root, but um, actually not at all a sequel to Root, but the uh, artist is the same, so there are some uh, same feelings there, and the, uh, the designer is the same. Um, I've been intrigued by Oath. Uh, when it hit Kickstarter, it was a really big deal, and I, again, I, I, at the time, thought it was intriguing, but it, well, speaking of war games, I kept hearing that it was very political, and also kind of a war game, even though it doesn't have, like, hexes on the map or anything like that. At least, I don't think it does. And because of that, I didn't latch onto it, and I did not back the campaign. Um, subsequently, um, now that people are receiving the game, and um, it seems like a lot of people are quite happy about it, uh, it's got me curious to try it again. Uh, a friend of mine uh, reached out um, to our group and asked if uh, people were interested in trying it on the official Tabletop Simulator uh, mod, and um, I told him that I am interested uh, in at least giving it a shot. Um, you know, once again, leading in, uh, away from that first question, I I'm trying to um, push the boundaries of what I think I like a little bit more and see if uh, perhaps my conceptions were wrong. Uh, so at this moment, I don't own a copy of Oath. I don't think I know anyone with a copy of it, but um, there is an official tabletop simulator mod, and it's possible we might get a game of that to try it out. I did listen to the Shut Up and Sit Down uh, podcast episode about it, and they had a lot of good things to say, which um, made me even more interested to try it. Uh, Mr. Wanted says, what are my top five games? Um, well, honestly, the easiest way to figure that one out <laughs> is to look at Board Game Geek. In fact, I recently realized that I had around uh, 10 games listed as a 10 out of 10 um, on my ratings for Board Game Geek. I'm not sure if that is still the same. So I, this isn't going to be a top five, but I'll tell you right now what my uh, what all the games I've rated as a 10 are on Board Game Geek. Um, every few months I go through this list, especially the things that are rated between 10 and 7, and I readjust things. Um, so for the 10s, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I think 9. Uh, so I have Teach You, Pandemic Legacy Season 1, Terraforming Mars, Pandemic Legacy Season 2, <laughs> sure you can see a trend there, uh, Spirit Island, Underwater Cities, Concordia Venus, Railroad Revolution with the Railroad Evolution Expansion. That is a very important distinction. And finally, A Feast for Odin with the Norwegians Expansion, which is, again, an important distinction. Um, a Feast for Odin without that expansion comes in at probably an 8 out of 10 for me, and Railroad Revolution without the Evolution Expansion comes in at, like, a 5 out of 10. It's a huge difference. Uh, the Sprutta asks, have you had a chance to try Sleeping Gods? I paid a little bit too much to get a copy, and after about 10 hours, I see myself playing it uh, for dozens more. Uh, that's really good to hear, because I have not had a chance to play Sleeping Gods yet, but I did actually either today or yesterday, put in a pre-order for it. Um, on Red Raven's official website, they just uh, opened up pre-orders for the second printing, and I believe they said it's not going to be delivered until, like, October or November, so it's going to be a while. But um, I did put in a pre-order there because I have talked to some friends who are interested in playing that with me. So at some point in the future, I will have a chance to play it. And it's nice to hear that you liked it because the pre-order with uh, shipping was not cheap. <laughs> it was certainly cheaper than buying the game on the second-hand market right now. Now. And with so many things to play, I decided not to pay an extra 60 or $70 to get it now when I could just wait a few months. Uh, Joe asks, do you ever uh, AP during your playthroughs? Uh, now, AP stands for analysis paralysis. And yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, when I play games with people, I... I, I I'm near the top of the bell curve as far as analysis paralysis is concerned, but not at the top. I definitely veer more towards AP than away from it, which is something I've been trying to work on for years, because it can be frustrating when other people are taking too long on, on their turn, and um, I get frustrated with myself when I can tell I am. Uh, now, the weird thing about recording the playthroughs that I do is that I am the only person there, and in general, from what I can tell, the um, social structure of annoying other people is the main thing that knocks uh, analysis paralysis people off of their paralysis and into doing something. So that means <laughs> if you're playing with somebody, you get to the point where you feel so bad that you don't really care about the fact that you have a suboptimal turn and you just take the turn because you're feeling so bad. But if it's just me in here with the camera going and me knowing that I can just chop out all of the dead air, well, I can really lean into that analysis paralysis. Um, I actually used to, well, last year I stopped making every single one of my tutorials a full playthrough. and. 
One of the reasons I did that is because I was spending so much time recording each of these videos. I was getting to the, getting to the point where the average raw video, like, you know, the time that the camera was running for the average game I was making was between 10 and 12 hours, which is an incredible amount of time for something that would oftentimes take like 90 minutes to play with three or four people around the table. Um, so by switching over and not doing full playthroughs and really focusing on the tutorials, it um, reduced the amount of time I spent recording and editing by a significant amount. But then, after a couple months of doing no full playthroughs, I started doing some again, and I'm to the point now where it seems like about one out of three videos I make are full playthroughs, and I'm finding that my average for recording a full playthrough is down to about seven hours, which is fascinating. I think part of that is because I tend to pick full playthroughs for games that are on the lighter side of things. If it's a really heavy game, I probably won't do a full playthrough of it right now just because of the time investment. But I do also think that um, by shaking things up and not making every video a full playthrough, um, I've gotten into a headspace where I don't AP as much and I'm more comfortable with just moving forward and just getting the video done and not really worrying about every single move being perfect because, of course, it's never always going to be perfect and I'm always probably going to be making mistakes. So yes, analysis paralysis is uh, a little demon of mine, and it definitely gets bigger in this room, and I'm I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, this is honestly one of the reasons why I've never done any live playthroughs, um, and I don't really see myself doing live playthroughs in the future. Everything could change, who knows? But uh, that's that's a big reason why. Uh, by the way, uh, welcome everyone who is here. Thank you so much for joining in. All right, Travis says, I backed the Darwin's Journey uh, game. As the rulebook writer, I know you may be biased, but do you see yourself rating it among your favorite recent Euros? Uh, well, <laughs> I actually have this open already. Uh, let's see here. Uh, right now on Board Game Geek, I already have Darwin's Journey rated as an 8 out of 10. Um, so that's a pretty good score overall. Uh, I've played it I think five times, uh, all on tabletop simulator. And it really kind of took our group by storm for about three to four weeks. We were just playing it over and over again. And then we got to the point, I think where a, we'd all played it several times and B, we kind of realized that we don't want to burn out playing it on tabletop simulator and then be less interested in playing it when it actually arrives. Uh, I actually bought, or I guess backed on Kickstarter, the collector's edition of the game. I know I could have asked for a copy from the publisher and I'm sure they would have sent it to me, but it just felt a little bit weird uh, because I tend to only feel comfortable getting free copies of games if it's for John Gitz games. And in this case, I've already covered Darwin's Journey in an impressions vlog, as well as with a tutorial. So when I get the final version of it, I probably won't make any more video content. So that's just for Jonathan Cox, the person who wants to own the game. Uh, so yeah, I, I've been really impressed with it. Um, and of course, I am super biased. I have put an incredible amount of time into the rulebook. Um, my wife, uh, Jessica, has also um, been aiding uh, things out. Uh, uh, I guess a better way to put it is she's been really helping out with the editing process of the rulebook. Uh, she has uh, a lot of strengths where I have weaknesses, so we complement each other really well. So it's been exciting actually working with her um, on that rulebook as well. Um, so yeah, um, as far as favorite recent Euros, um, I really considered putting it on my top 10 list for last year, considering I did play it on Tabletop Simulator before the end of the year. But that felt a little weird because it was technically a prototype on Tabletop Simulator. Um, it would surprise me if um, Darwin's Journey does not make a top 10 list for the year that it officially gets published. Um, I really like it, and I'm looking forward to playing it more, even though there's a lot going on. Um, I'll be the first to admit there are a lot of rules considering I'm the person who's been writing the rulebook. There's a, a lot of rules to that game, but it does come together in a great way. Again, I'm super biased, but I've really enjoyed playing it. Uh, Shrey says, what do you think of the modules in the Underwater Cities expansion? Uh, well, I've actually only played the Underwater Cities expansion once at this point, um, and it was on Tabletop Simulator. I do own it, a, a physical copy of it. And if I remember correctly, it has a museum module, which is a, a medium-sized board that you put next to the main board. Uh, it also has some asymmetric uh, starting assistance, and it also has just some different player boards that you can play with. Um, now, I have not played with the big museum board, and the reason for that is because when I read all of the rules to the game, I didn't really want to. So I haven't played the museum board. I can't tell you if it's actually any good or not, but I love underwater cities and I feel like it's got enough going on with its core loops and all the decisions that you're making that I just don't really see a world where I want to add 
a bunch more complexity of rules that come in for, through a board, uh, this museum board, with a bunch more tokens and a bunch more incentives. The game already has tons of incentives for doing a ton of different things. So even though I do own the expansion, I don't really see myself playing with the museum board. That being said, I don't see myself not playing with the rest of the modules, at least um, the ones that are coming to mind. The asymmetric assistance, they seem fun. I like some asymmetry like that. Uh, there's also just more cards shuffled into the deck, so I've shuffled those in there and those are going to stay. Um, and then as far as the boards are concerned, um, I do know that uh, when I played it that one time, we played with a variant where you will actually take your um, uh, metropolises as the game is going. I can't remember the specifics of how it works, but I did like how that worked. Instead of just getting random metropolises and working it into your strategy at the beginning of the game, you have a market of them, and when you connect them, you can actually take those metropolises. And it wouldn't surprise me if I play with that one more. Um, uh, that one... I think I actually bought that one. Uh, they offered me a copy of it and I declined uh, because I felt guilty about it because I knew I wouldn't be covering it for John Gis Games. And then about a month later, I decided to actually purchase a copy of it. Um, I, I, I um, hope it's worth the money. I don't remember how much money I spent on it. It, it, it honestly might not have been, but um, I have it and I'm happy to have it. I mean, Underwater Cities is a top 10 game, so it's hard not to uh, get an expansion, especially one that has a bunch of different modules that don't increase the complexity of the game a bunch, even if I just ignore the part of the expansion that does. All right. Shrey says, if you rate Concordia Venus a 10, what do you rate Concordia? I have a base as a base game as 10 and Venus as a 9. Um, I have Concordia as a 9. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, I used to rate Concordia as a 10 out of 10, and then Venus came along, and I like it more than Concordia, and I decided to bump Concordia down and put Concordia Venus in at the 10 spot because um, it just seemed like if they're both at the 10 spot, that means they're somewhat equal. I'm not sure if that's actually true. Honestly, now that I'm starting to talk it out, I'm thinking maybe I should change that. Maybe I should just have them both as a 10 because they do offer different experiences. Um, I adore Concordia Venus. I think it's an amazing game, but it feels like less of an expansion to Concordia and more of like a, a sequel or a, a sibling or something like that, an alternate universe version of v, uh, Concordia because it is a team-based game. You can play some of the cards uh, in a fully competitive game setting, but I haven't actually tried that and I don't really have much interest in it. Um, so yeah, actually, the more I think about it, they are so different. I think I should probably both have them as a 10 because I don't have any issues with Concordia. Honestly, the, the games that I have as a 10 out of 10 are games where I, I can't really come up with anything I don't like about them. <laughs> like, they just seem like they couldn't be better in my perspective. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm going to change Concordia. Concordia just got upgraded. Thank you, Shrey, for bringing that up. Um, I, I do love Concordia in a competitive circumstance. Um, and even though I technically like Venus more, I just find it a little bit deeper. And I love the interaction with your partner where you can't really communicate. Um, that's just different. Uh, and I really shouldn't judge them the way I have. Uh, Denicha says, I'm supposed to get Dwellings of Eldervale, uh, Dwellings of Eldervale delivered tomorrow, and I have your videos of it queued up to watch while I unbox it. Was it a memorable game for you? Um, <laughs> so, I made a sponsored tutorial for Dwellings of Eldervale, and it really impressed me while I was making that video. I, I liked um, essentially all of the ideas that I saw coming in. Uh, it had uh, multi-use cards. Uh, it also had some engine building with the worker placement. It just had a lot of really cool ideas. Um, I did actually end up playing a game of this. I believe it was four players on Tabletop Simulator last year, and uh, or maybe it was this year. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I, I didn't really enjoy the game. And in fact, none of my friends did, uh, which was a big surprise to me. I, I actually pushed to play it because I thought it might hit my top 10 list for last year. Um, I liked making the video so much. I was like, let's play it for reals. Um, and it'll probably, you know, knock something else out in the top 10 list because it looks so cool. But unfortunately, even though I like all of the different parts of the game, I think there is some really cool design. It just did not come together very well. It seemed like the sum of the parts was uh, less than you would expect. Um, all of these different ideas came together in a way that kind of hampered each other. And um, uh, out of the four players, two of us uh, really didn't like it. Uh, I was pretty take it or leave it, and one friend was interested in playing it again, so it's not like it was a total uh, dive, but um, that was a little unfortunate, and I do think um, this was 
one of the games that made me feel like uh, maybe I don't want to uh, uh, talk about every game I play on my impressions vlog. Maybe I want to change things up and just to, uh, call it a good games vlog because I didn't really want to sit here for 10 minutes explaining all the nitty gritty reasons why I didn't like it. It just didn't sound like something I want to do anymore. It's part of the reason I stopped doing reviews. And also, you know, I was paid to make a video for that. And I um, would like to work with that publisher more. And, you know, it's definitely some conflicting interests that come into play there. Uh, but with these live Q&As, I'm, I'm going to try not to censor myself. <laughs> so I hope that you enjoy it. Uh, I, I really do. I've seen a lot of people very much enjoy it. That's part of the reason I pushed to play it before I made my top 10 list for last year is because I saw it on many other people's top 10 list. So just because it didn't really work for us won't mean it won't for work for other people. Um, it didn't seem like the game was broken or anything. It just didn't seem like it worked for us. And maybe it was just a bad play and uh, we'd like it the second time. It's, it's sometimes hard to tell. Travis asks, what is the most difficult game you've ever had to teach either in person or through a video tutorial? Um, well. Through a video tutorial, that is easy. <laughs> that would be Feudum. Uh, that game was crazy. <laughs> I just, I, I remember when it, it first came out. Actually, before the uh, Kickstarter for that one came out, the publisher reached out to me about making a uh, video for it, a full playthrough. Um, they sent me the rule book, and I... I just, I felt like I was having like a fever dream or something like that, reading this rule book. Like it had all of these euro -y neat ideas, but then it had this trippy artwork and it had very strange components. Uh, just a, a super weird game. And uh, I actually reached back out to them and I said that I would do it, but for double my normal sponsorship cost. Uh, at that point, I was charging the same amount of money for every video. And I was just like, I can't charge the same amount of money I do for like a 60 minute game as I would for Feudum. Uh, and they declined. They said that that was too much and that was fine. So I didn't make a video for their campaign. And then uh, when it actually fulfilled, they sent me a copy um, for free. And then they asked again if I wanted to make a sponsored video. And I think I was just a little thirstier at that point. I think I was uh, having a lull in my uh, uh, sponsored videos. So I said yes for my standard rate, not the doubled one. And wow, was that a beast. <laughs> uh, I, I can't remember exactly how much time it took. I think it was uh, one of the longest uh, videos that I've recorded. Uh, probably not the longest. I think Frosthaven was one of the longest ones, but it was definitely much more complicated than Frosthaven to teach and to get right. It's just got so many systems going on, so many different ideas. Is it really kind of? Uh, I remember when I first looked at the rule book, I came away saying it seemed like Cones of Dunshire in real life. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably a much more playable game than Cones of Dunshire. And I've heard that some people who can invest in it and really understand all the rules do enjoy it. Um, and for a while there, I, I was interested in playing my copy with other people because I was intrigued by all the wackiness, but I never actually did get a, a play of it in. As far as the hardest game I've had to teach in person, <sighs> That's tough. Um, I mean, the first thing that pops into my head is probably Gloomhaven um, because there are a lot of rules going on there. And we did have a campaign of that a while ago. So I'll probably say that for now, even though it's probably not the actual correct answer. Uh, maybe something like Sid Meier's Civilization that I played many times back in like 2011. That might be a better answer, but uh, uh, for the most part, um, it seems like most game teachers feel about the same with, you know, a couple things that stick out. Uh, but the big things that stick out are the videos because they take so much longer to teach. Instead of having like an hour and a half teach with friends around the table, if I spent like 27 hours making the video, that's going to stick out a lot more. All right. The next question comes from Arif and says, have you ever tried War of the Ring? Uh, if, uh, if you could not be on, oh, I see. Uh, if you could not be on an interesting dudes on the map to try it out. Uh, I think you're just saying it's a dudes on the map game to try out. Um, I have not played War of the Ring um, for, like I said earlier on, it, it, it's a war game. And because of that, I've kind of avoided it. Also, it was kind of famous for being ludicrously expensive when I was first getting into the hobby like 12 years ago. Um, it was often, uh, you know, any time a copy of it went up on some auction, it would sell for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So uh, that was enough for me to not really look into it. Honestly, I don't know anything more about it than assuming it's, you know, Mordor versus everybody else. And I, I could be wrong about that. I've, I've never really looked into it. 
Uh, Shrey says, uh, Shrey agrees about the underwater city's expansion. Uh, I think the best part of the expansion is the quick start tiles. The museum doesn't really add enough. Oh, that's right. That's right. Actually, that's that's huge. I totally forgot about that. And that's one of the reasons I bought the expansion uh, for underwater cities is the fact that um, the base game takes 10 rounds to play and the expansion comes in with these quick start tiles where you can draft them and then you play through nine rounds instead of 10. So it's kind of like it's 10% quicker, although there is a little bit of time spent actually drafting those tiles. And again, I've only played the, the game with the expansion once, but I, I don't see a reason not to continue playing with those tiles. So uh, that's just another reason why uh, I'm glad that I have a copy of it and I'm looking forward to playing it at some point in person. Uh, Gabriel asks, do I still play through the ages? Um, not really <laughs> is the short answer. Uh, I guess that's, that's, that's a lie. I did play it last year and through the ages is the kind of game that tends to be played about once a year. So, so yeah, um, I don't play it with any regularity. Uh, there was a time period about six or seven years ago where I was playing it online a lot. And last year, Ooh, at some point in the middle of the pandemic, I can't remember, I guess the pandemic's still going on, but at some point in the middle of 2020, we played a game of it with uh, the iOS implementation. Uh, I've played about 30 games of the original plus the new story version on boardgaming.net, which was a browser-based way to play the game. And then uh, myself and some friends decided to try it out with the, uh, the iOS app, uh, playing it asynchronously. And it worked well, but I got to be honest that I, I I didn't love the application. It seemed like too many things were hard to find when just playing the game on my uh, small phone and the uh, art was fine, but it was really hard to kind of figure out everything that was going on uh, compared to sitting at a table, looking around, as well as, um, well, I got really used to playing on boardgaming.net. Uh, so maybe I just got a little bit uh, too stuck in my habit there. Um, I did I did uh, enjoy that game of Through the Ages, but I have to admit that as, as time goes on and each time I play it, I feel like I maybe like it a little bit less. And this is a game that I have played close to 40 times. Again, if you combine the original game plus new story, I think about 75% of my plays were the original game. We played it a lot before the new version came out. And then I played the new version um, probably close to 10 times or so now. Um, so that's a lot. That, that's a lot of times to play it. And I know that some people play that game um, hundreds of times. Uh, honestly, some of my friends play one game a day on the iOS against uh, an AI. But um, for me, I remember playing it the last time feeling like I think I'd rather just play Nations, which is another game I played last year for the first time in a long time and was... Um, more impressed by it, I guess. Like I, I was playing it and I was like, oh, I'm enjoying this more than I remember. And I think it's because it does maybe have some simpler systems. And also it's just nicer. Through the ages when played with people who know that game can be incredibly punishing. Uh, it might not have a map. It might not have troops on it, but you can just destroy people with military. And I don't think that happened to me. I can't remember specifically, but that last game we played last year did get hyper militaristic for some reason. And um, that's stressful, especially when you're playing it asynchronously so that a game takes like a week. That's a long time to like be going through this situation, especially if you are not the strongest and you are worried about being aggressed upon. Um, so I think I'm to the point with Through the Ages where I'm not interested in playing it asynchronously at all. And I could certainly see myself playing it in person again in the future. I've done that many times. And in general, um, with the people I play with, a three-player game, usually takes about three hours. So it's not a crazy expenditure of time, especially if you get blown out by military. But but I do think that is going to be where I land. I guess I ended up talking about asynchronous more than the game itself. Uh, I still think it's a solid game. I think it's an exceptional game uh, as far as its design is concerned. But um, as far as my enjoyment of it, it's definitely fallen down over the years. Right. All right, one second. My computer is lagging. All right. Okay, there we go. The computer's back. <laughs> All right, Joe Chang says, I really enjoyed you on the Going Analog podcast. What is your favorite spiky game? Um, 
thank you. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed uh, that. Uh, that was cool. Uh, they're really nice people. Um, I had not heard of that podcast before, but I don't pay that much attention to board gaming podcasts these days. Uh, but it was fun to be on that. Um, I would love to answer your question, Joe, but I'm not sure what you mean by spiky game. So could you uh, define that a little bit more? And, and then I'll get back to you. Uh, Truck Driving Gamer says, have you thought about doing a solo playthrough of Feast for Odin with the Norwegians, maybe with the Harvest uh, Many expansion added in as well? Um, well, no, I, I haven't thought about it. Um, I did do a two-player full playthrough of a Feast for Odin with the Norwegians expansion, and um, if I'm being honest, I am not a solo gamer, and as time goes on, I I've... I've realized I'm more of an anti-solo gamer, not against other people who enjoy solo gaming. I have no problem with that. But for me, I every time I try to play a game solo, I just dislike the experience. It's something about my brain. I just need at least one other person at the table to either work with or against. And um, I just cannot get into solo gaming. Uh, so because of that, I don't see myself spending time to make a video of it. Uh, it would not surprise me if other people who are really interested in solo gaming, uh, have made videos about it. I, I can't be sure about that, but um, there are many uh, YouTube channels um, these days that seem to um, maybe not necessarily focus on solo, but definitely uh, enjoy it more than I do. And uh, I, I would check out something like that. Um, also, I, I try not to make the same video multiple times, and I know that the solo experience is different uh, for A Feast for Odin. Um, if I remember correctly, I think you just when you play one round, you put your workers down, and then the next round, you use, use another color worker, and then you essentially blocked yourself with the other workers that you placed, which seems fascinating, honestly, like a great bit of design. But um, as far as my interest in it, I just don't see myself going there, especially considering I, you know, already spent like 16 or so hours uh, making a full playthrough of that one that is up there on the internet. Uh, David asks, it look or says, it looks like BGG Con 2021 is a go. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, my thoughts are, I'm hoping to go. <laughs> my thoughts are excitement. Uh, I love Board Game Geek Con. Um, I can't say I've gone every year. Well, I guess I can say I've gone every year it's been available since 2014. I think it was the first time I went. Obviously, it did not happen last year. And that was a bummer. Uh, I, I look forward to Board Game Geek Con all year long. Uh, honestly, uh, the closest thing I have to recurring dreams these days as an adult is a few times throughout the year, I'll have Board Game Geek Con dreams where, I'm at the convention and it's almost over and I've somehow not played like any of the games that I wanted to and I'm just so upset that the convention's almost over and I have to wait a whole nother year to arrive. So that'll tell you a little bit about my brain, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so I'm really uh, happy that it looks like they're going to try to make it happen. It's obviously happening way at the end of the year, I think in about five months or so. And considering where things are in the United States in general, as far as vaccination is concerned, um, I'm hopeful. Um, I mean, I am fully vaccinated and I have been for a month or two now. And um, they did announce along with saying that it's going to be happening, that they're not sure what the actual uh, policies are going to be, whether or not there will be mandatory mask areas or if you have to disclose your vaccination status or any of those kind of things. They're kind of keeping it up in the air because, you know, a lot could change in five months. And I, uh, think that makes sense. Uh, but for now, I am planning on going. I'm not sure how many of the friends that usually attend are also planning on going. Um, I need to have a conversation with some of them, specifically the people I usually uh, room with. Um, but um, I'm hoping that will all work out and I'm hoping to have a great time. Um, of course, something could swing through and really change that. But um, right now, I'm hopeful. Uh, I am essentially planning on making that my only convention this year. Uh, I've thought a bunch about going to Essen Spiel again this year. Um, I haven't been since 2018. Um, and I was planning on going last year. I had a hotel booked and everything. And I actually have a hotel booked for this year as well. But I don't know. I think between the two, I just, I don't mind waiting another year on Spiel. It, it is a super fun time. I really enjoy doing it. But uh, flying from California to Germany is very expensive. And so I think waiting one more year and going back to Spiel in 2022 makes a little bit more sense. Uh, maybe I'll go to other conventions next year. I, I'm really not sure, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, the fact that Board Game Geek Con is essentially the last convention of the year uh, and it's the farthest away of all the others in this season does make it, um, you know, a better target to potentially go to an in-person convention at this point. Uh, all right. 
Trey says, uh, regarding difficult teaches, I find that complex rules isn't really a problem. Difficult teach happens more when someone isn't paying attention or is having a hard time understanding uh, what their options are. I try to stop myself from making too many suggestions, but if someone is struggling, I find it hard to figure out how to balance helping them versus seeming patronizing. What do I think? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good point. Um, I've definitely had situations where I'm teaching a game that does not seem like it's crazy complex and people just don't get it. And, um, that can, that can be tough. <laughs> that can be a tough nut to crack, but, um, I think, you know, I guess it's all about the tone. You know, if you start to sound uh, like, you know, sighing and exasperated and whatnot, then that is going to sour the mood. But I think if you just stay positive and just ask like, you know, so what, what part exactly isn't connecting for you, I think that uh, could certainly help things out. Um, if people aren't paying attention, then that's, that's just a whole other thing. <laughs> uh, and uh, in general, I, I don't have issues with that. Uh, the people that I play games with, usually if somebody ends up not paying attention, uh, we have a kind of um, social construct that you just say, I'm sorry, my mind was wandering and could you repeat the, the last 30 seconds or, or whatever. So we try to be uh, really cognizant of that. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the complexity of the game to the teach, um, you do make a good point. I mean, honestly, I just um, yesterday filmed a full playthrough for Dual Gauge with the Wisconsin map and um, I really enjoyed doing it because I do enjoy that game and it was fun to explore a new map. Um, but that rule book is only like eight pages long. It doesn't seem very dense, but man, it took a long time to actually convey all of the rules for this game. Uh, like it took about the same amount of time to teach these rules as it did for other uh, games that might have like a 20 plus page rule book. And I think it's because of the interactions of the rules. Like you could just read the rules to dual gauge and read the rules to something with a ton of, ton of rules, like, you know, Frosthaven or uh, maybe Valor and Villainy. Um, and it'll take a lot shorter to actually read dual gauge, but to really explore all of the ramifications and say, you know, like, you know, I just told you three sentences, but now here's what that actually means with how these things interact. It just took a lot longer. And maybe I was just being overly verbose. My throat was pretty sore at the end of yesterday. I was talking for many hours. Uh, I think the final video is going to end up being around two hours itself. Um, but the actual teach part, uh, along with the playthrough, um, kind of ended after an hour, but, but either way, I do think the, um, the number of rules does not necessarily match the complexity of the teach. That is definitely true. Um, class says your playthrough of mosaic hit 16,000 views. Great job. Do you have a good sense of which of your videos will do well? Um, yeah, to a certain degree. Yeah, that, that's great. Honestly, 16,000 views is awesome. Um, and I think a big reason for that is because of Kickstarter. Uh, in general, videos that are associated with Kickstarter campaigns are going to do better than videos that aren't, um, unless it happens to be a game that's particularly hyped. And I guess that's really where it's at. Um, if I know everybody's talking about a game, then I know that it's probably likely that game will do well. And again, Kickstarter is just a new different funnel to get a bunch of eyes on a video compared to just posting it on social media and putting it up onto BoardGameGeek. And of course the subscription feed for the channel. Um, there have been times, I can't come up with any examples off the top of my head, but there have been times where I thought a video would do well and it just sinks and I cannot figure out why. Um, there are the times where a video that just seems uh, for a game that I've never really heard of before, but you know, seems cool and make a video, put it out there. And then it goes like gangbusters and, and I really can't, um, uh, uh, figure out exactly why, but those do tend to be outliers. Um, for the most part, if it's a Kickstarter, especially if it's from a well-established uh, publisher who's made lots of things in the past, then that's going to help. Like if I make a tiny Epic video, I know it's going to do well. <laughs> and you know, when I was making the video for Frosthaven, I knew that was going to do well as well. Uh, my Gloomhaven video is by far and away the uh, biggest, uh, uh, the most watched video that I've ever done. It's gone over half a million views, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, I, I, I tend to have an idea, but I try not to get my hopes up and I try not to pay too much attention to it because paying too much attention to numbers is a really good way to bum me out, uh, because, you know, I, I haven't honed this channel into being a numbers efficiency machine. I, I've honed this channel to make content that I feel comfortable making that I feel like 
you know, board gamers are going to want to uh, uh, consume. But um, I've never, uh, I've made very few decisions about how I make these videos uh, just because I want to get the numbers up, if that makes sense. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, um, I think better for my sanity. Honestly, if this was just all a numbers game and I just made top 10 list after top 10 list, um, I probably would have burned out because I wouldn't have the passion and interest there. But it also means that I spend a lot of time making videos that, you know, will get a couple thousand views uh, compared to, you know, every time I make a top 10 list, it gets, you know, at least twice the videos of my average playthrough, which, you know, is something that I, that I think about sometimes, but I, I try not to. <laughs> I try not to. I, I do get paid for most of my playthroughs, and that is a, that's most of my income, if I'm being honest. So that is uh, definitely something to consider. All right. Uh, coming back to Joe Chang's question. Uh, so let's see. The question was... What is your favorite spiky game? And the definition of a spiky game is uh, I talked on that podcast about games uh, being circles. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, so my question is, what's your favorite clunky game? So in that um, episode of the Going Cardboard podcast, uh, it's a discussion style podcast. And they asked me if I had a discussion topic to discuss. And um, after thinking about it, I told them I wanted to talk about elegance in games, specifically that word and what it means for me and what it means for other people, because it's thrown around a lot by people in board game media. And I have a very specific definition for it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it like crazy here, <laughs> but um, the short version of my definition of elegance is if I was to imagine a game design as a physical object, then I, I see an elegant game as being a smooth ball, essentially. The, the mechanics all wrap around back into each other. There's no vestigial mechanics that kind of don't seem like they belong. And there's, you know, no mechanics that seem like they're a bump on the ball that you kind of, you know, have issues with. Um, so in this case, Joe is asking what uh, spiky games I have. So what are my favorite games that I don't think are particularly elegant? So with that in mind, let's look back over here. Well, this is an easy answer. Teach you. <laughs> Teach you is... Arguably my favorite game. Uh, uh, definitely a solid argument to be made for that. I've played it well over 200 times. It is a brilliant uh, partnership-based uh, climbing style game, but it is spiky when it comes to the rules. The actual core loop of the game is pretty elegant uh, when it comes to just, you know, you're playing cards out and you have to match uh, the type of pattern that other people put down, uh, but it has to be better. That'll make sense. But immediately you start talking about what the patterns are and you have like, you could put a single card down or a pair or consecutive pairs or a three of a kind, but not consecutive three of a kinds. So those aren't good. Uh, also, there's a full house, which is comfortable if you know poker, but it seems a little bit clunky, a, a three of a kind and a two of a kind, uh, if not. Also, this is a game with suits, but the suits almost never matter <laughs> in Teach You. I mean, when they matter, they really matter, and I'm not going to go into the details why. But then you also have these four um, Joker cards with the one, uh, with the dog, the dragon, and the phoenix, and they all have their own special rules. The one um, also has this extra rule tacked on top that lets you wish for other cards out of people's hands. Uh, then there's the Tichu rules. There's the Grand Tichu rules. There's just a lot of rules to teach. And Tichu is a strangely difficult game to teach. And I think a big part of that is because when I envision the mechanical shape of this game, it is it is not a circle. <laughs> Maybe it's a, a square. Uh, I think it's more like a tree. I think there's lots of vestigial little rules like the, the, the wishing rule. And honestly, I found the best way to teach Tichu is to start with the core loop and then play around and then add a couple rules and then play around and then add in more rules because while I think all of these rules make for a brilliant game, one of my favorite games that I love to play, um, you can't just teach everybody or it's, it's a bad idea to just teach all of the rules to teach you and then say, okay, now we're going to play the game because I have done that before and people just lock down and that first round will take like 45 minutes and no one's having fun and um, I, I want people to have fun when they're playing teach you because I adore it. So there you go. <laughs> uh, Omar says, what Kickstarters, if any, have you backed in the last month or two? If none, what games are you anticipating receiving in the near future that you are uh, really excited about? Well, I don't think I've backed anything on Kickstarter recently. Um, actually, no, that, that's that's a lie. The last game that I backed was Rivet Heads, which is a game from New Mill Publisher uh, or New Mill Games, I think is the name of it. Uh, they're a new publisher, uh, just two people, and they 
package the games up themselves. It's a very uh, um, low overhead kind of uh, uh, publisher. And this is the first game I'm getting from them, but the game looked really cool. It's got kind of a action programming um, card tableau mechanic. And I also like the idea of supporting a small publisher that's being run by people who have regular day jobs and that's being, you know, packaged together in their houses and dropped off, you know, at the post office by them. It's it's a very, um, you know, uh, <laughs> bootstraps, I guess, kind of uh, operation they have going there. And I wanted to support it. The game also looks cool. And I just saw a tweet this morning that all of the games are in the mail. So I should actually probably get it soon, which is pretty cool considering I backed that campaign like two months ago. And I think that's part of the allure of the model they have. Um, they put out the campaign and then they immediately ordered all of the materials. They had it shipped to one of their houses and they box it up and sent it out. So it's a very quick turnaround when you don't have to, you know, have it made in China and go across on some boats. So um, I guess uh, Rivet Heads is where I'm at. I'm also excited to try it. It looks like a pretty cool game. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Um, I mentioned this uh, earlier on, but this is the first video that I'm doing that has the chat actually on screen. Uh, so if anybody has feedback about that, then I would love to hear it either right now or in comments later. Um, I'm probably going to try to make the text a little bit bigger in the next one. Um, that's the feedback that I'm seeing <laughs> immediately, but uh, this is something I'm experimenting with and, uh, you know, I like feedback. All right, so Coralu says, often when learning games multi-handed solo, I will test out two players, three players, and four players, and sometimes the differences surprises me. How do you decide how many players you will use for your playthroughs? Um, yeah, that's a great question because games really can be very different for uh, at these different player counts. Um, that's one of the reasons why way back when, when I used to make reviews, I had a whole section dedicated to what games were like at the player counts because um, some great games are just not good at certain player counts. Uh, when it comes to my playthrough tutorial videos, um, essentially I default to three players. Um, and if there's nothing that really pushes me away from three players, then I'll make a three player video. Um, sometimes if it's a game that has, um, just an incredible amount of stuff, well, for example, the mosaic video, um, I was planning on doing a three player game of that one. And, um, man, I hope I'm not wrong about this. I was planning on doing a three player game, but I, I believe I ended up just doing a two player game because I could barely fit it on my table. Uh, but now the more I think about it, the more I can't remember if I did three players or two players. Okay. A better example is a feast for Odin with the Norwegians expansion. Um, that one brilliant game. It's amazing at three players, but I was going to have a hard time fitting all of that on the table with the camera, considering the tableau building, considering the tetrising of all the little pieces. Um, so I decided to go two players with that. Uh, but then other times when I'm just reading through the rules, um, I can just get a feeling like, I think this will show better with more than three players. And um, so we'll go up to four players. Um, there was a game that I did recently. Actually, there's Darwin's Journey. That's a good example. So I filmed that one at four players uh, strictly because the prototype that I had, um, it was not... <sighs> In order to show a three-player game, I didn't really have the uh, components to show it well on camera, and I wanted the video to be very future-proof, if that makes sense. So I decided to go at a higher player count because of the uh, prototype that I had, uh, and I was just really worried about it being uh, very clear. Um, if I think about other things... And again, now that I'm saying that, I'm like, did I do Darwin's Journey at four players? I'm pretty sure I did. Anyway, the long version of it uh, <laughs> ends up being, um, I start with three players and I see if it wants to push or pull in different directions. For Dual Gauge that I just filmed, I did a four player game. And I think I've done four player uh, games for all of the Cube Rails videos that I've done, like Iberian Gauge and Trans-Siberian Railroad and um, Ride the Rails, uh, because those are stock holding games and it just seems like they're a little bit more interesting with more players holding the different stocks. So um, I've also, those games in general are lighter on the rule sets. So I don't feel as bad, um, you know, showing all that much stuff on the table. Uh, Shrey says, what are your thoughts on the minor boom in new trick taking games? Do you enjoy trick takers and do I have any favorites? Um, I don't really have many thoughts about it because I didn't know there was a minor boom happening in trick-taking games. Uh, I definitely hear about trick-taking games uh, popping up every now and then, especially when I'm uh, trolling the Board Game Geek submissions, when I'm trying to put together my uh, games radar vlogs. Um, but when it comes to my actual 
perspective on trick-taking games. Um, I think they're fine. Um, I know a lot of people call Teach You a trick-taking game, but I think um, in my definition, it, it is not. It's a, it's a climbing game. Uh, the way I see trick-taking games, those are games where you have a hand of cards and you always play just one card into the trick. Once everybody has played a card, then you know, the trick is evaluated and you move on. Whereas in Teach You, you can play lots of cards. You can sometimes play multiple cards in the same round as you go around and around. It just seems different. Um, as far as my preferences for trick-taking games, I, I do think they're fine. I like the crew a lot. And honestly, the crew is probably easily my favorite trick-taking game. Uh, it's a cooperative game, which makes the experience quite fascinating. Uh, and when I think about other trick-taking games that I've played, most of them are just fine. Um, Stitch Elm, is a trick-taking game, or I guess um, the new uh, printing of it is called Stick'em from Capstone Games. Uh, that one is a cool game. I've really enjoyed playing that one. So I think my favorite is The Crew, and uh, Stick'em would be my second favorite. Um, and then trying to go for a third, I can't really come up with anything. I played a lot of Hearts when I was younger, especially on the computer, and I remember enjoying that. So uh, trick-taking is definitely not an area of board gaming that I've uh, delved too deeply into. All right. Have I heard of potions and profits? That's what I am interested in. Um, no, I haven't heard of that one at all. Uh, Truck Driving Gamer says, a game that's recently caught my eye is Feeds of An Fields of Andor. Do you know it and recommend it? Uh, I have not heard of that before. Um, Andor sounds familiar. I feel like there was a cooperative game called something of Andor that I can't remember right now um, that had like a set number of turns or there's some something quirky about it, but I have never actually played any games with the word Andor in it. So unfortunately, I can't recommend it. Um, I should probably look into that just to see what that one is about. Uh, Best at Star Trek asks, what is my favorite tea game? Uh, I am assuming <laughs> you're talking about the slew of games with a, that start with a T that have come out from uh, Board and Dice slash NSKN over the last few years, like Teotihuacan, Tawantinsuyu, uh, Tekenu, and those are the three that I'm thinking of right now. Are there any more? There might be. Anyway, uh, those are the three that I can think of at the moment. Um, I have... Never actually played to want and sue you with anybody else. I made a sponsored video for it, but it was not a full playthrough. Uh, I did play a, a full two-player game of Tekenu, and I played Teotihuacan a few times. Um, I would love to say that Teotihuacan is my favorite because um, that is a... I call them like a uh, canyon game <laughs> in my head. Like, uh, like I see the Grand Canyon and I see Evil Knievel like trying to jump the Grand Canyon in uh, their motorcycle. And um, that's one of those games where it seems like the motorcycle didn't quite cover, uh, reach, breach the canyon. So it uh, just crashes, you know, just before it reaches the other edge. Uh, so what I mean by that is the game looks great. I want to love it. I love so many different things about it. And it just did not come together for me. And because it didn't come together for me, instead of being like, oh, I want this to be 10, a, a 10 out of 10, but it's a nine out of 10. It's like, oh, I want this to be a 10 out of 10, but it's more like a five or six out of 10. Um, and a big part of Teotihuacan was that I loved the core loop of the game. I love the idea of the um, action rondelle that's different each time you play. I love the idea of the upgradable workers, but there were just way too many things going on in that game for my uh, my preference. There are so many tracks and Teotihuacan just seemed like the kind of game that I actually talked a bit about, I think in that Going Cardboard podcast um, that shipped with like two expansions worth of material already in there. And I want to play Teotihuacan without all that stuff so that, you know, the extra modules and stuff could be added in. But uh, I would just love to play the like 60 to 90 minute version of Teotihuacan because it had such wonderful ideas, but uh, it was just too much for me. Just too many different um, ideas. Um, a lot of people love it and I don't begrudge them at all. But I, I every time I played it, I found myself wishing I was actually enjoying it more than I was. Um, so yeah. Uh, I guess that means Tekenu is my favorite, and I enjoyed Tekenu. Um, I'd probably rank it a 7 out of 10 or so. So what that means is I guess I haven't been blown away by the T games for the most part, uh, but again, I can only think of three of them off the top of my head. Uh, Coralou says, uh, <laughs> like a circle, square, or tree, this is starting to sound like an interview question. What shape do you see yourself as? Yes, <laughs> it, it totally is. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know where I really came up with that, but um, just at some point, I just started kind of envisioning these shapes, and uh, it, it just kind of made sense to me. It seems a bit loosey-goosey, I, I agree. All 
All right. Jason says, The Fox in the Forest for a number three. Uh, so you're talking about the trick-taking games. And yeah, that's a good that's a good number three. I have played The Fox in the Forest once. It's a two-player only trick-taking game. And I enjoyed it. I thought it was really smart. So there you go. That one um, would definitely be a number three. I, I do think I like Stick'em more than I enjoyed Fox in the Forest. But that was a solid game. Um, let's see. Oh, um, Klaus says that Zolkin is another T game um, from uh, the same designer. And that's a good point. Um, Zolkin was published by Czech Games Edition, not by NSKN slash Board and Dice. But um, same designer, also got a T game in there. And um, Zolkin was actually the second video I ever made. I made a Zolkin uh, review that was back in 2014. And I wanted so desperately to like that game. Uh, honestly, if you want to hear my extended thoughts about it, then uh, check out that video. It's old. <laughs> I'm holding a, my iPhone. Uh, I'm not even sure if my face is in that video. Maybe it is right at the very beginning. But things were a lot different back then. Um, I, I wanted to love Zulkin. I played it a bunch. Um, and I remember the first time I played it, I was like, oh, this game is great. And the second time I played it, I was like, oh, I, I really like this game. And the more I played it, the more I disliked it for a variety of reasons that I go on and on about in that review. Um, if I had to play a T game right now, putting all of them in front of me, honestly, I would probably go for Zulkin though. That might be just because it's been, you know, six, seven, eight years since I've actually played it. Um, but I do remember having a lot of really good times with that one. And um, there's quite a bit going on there, but man, I loved the gear mechanic with the workers. I thought that was so cool. I just didn't like some of the emergent um, issues that happened with the strategies. My, my biggest problem with Zilkin was that it seemed like, for me, you know, as an amateur gamer, definitely not an expert at the game, but it seemed like it was really hard to change strategies as you were going through the game. And it seemed like if you kind of commit to a strategy in the first 10%, like you kind of have to, and somebody else commits to the same strategy, and a third person commits to a different strategy, that third person is going to have a much easier time. At least that was what I found. It seemed like, you know, if if I, you know, I go with a strategy and somebody else goes with a, we're just going to be competing, getting in each other's way, making each other inefficient while somebody else is just shoving skulls into Chechen Itza. Um anyway, I'm sure there's ways to get around that. I'm sure uh, people will say I'm wrong, but that that's the way it seemed to me and ultimately that kind of uh, uh soured me on the entire game. Best at Star Trek says, "Would you prefer to meet over the T series games. I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> uh, let's see. Would I prefer to play Merv over a T game? Uh, no. Um, I, I talked about Merv a little bit in a couple of vlogs. I didn't do uh, an impressions vlog on it. Uh, I played it once and bounced pretty hard off of it um, for a variety of reasons, but the biggest one was I just was not enjoying it. It just seemed like I had a really hard time seeing what my actions were going to turn into. And because of that, I played very poorly. And I, I just did not enjoy that one, which surprised me because I thought I really would. And I've enjoyed other Fabio Lopiano games. Um, so I would probably prefer to play just about all of the T games before I play Merv. Um, Truck Driving Gamer says, sorry, it was supposed to be Legends of Andor. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Legends of Andor is a game that I have heard of. <laughs> uh, the question is, do I play, uh, and yeah, Legends of Andor is a game that, um, I've heard good things about over the years, but never actually had an opportunity to try. Uh, so the question here is, do you play online with Tabletop Simulator at all, or do you only... Uh, want to play with real pieces and parts. Um, I have played a ton of tabletop simulator games over the last year. Uh, essentially, every game I've talked about um, on my impressions vlogs for the entirety of 2020 uh, had screenshots of me playing in tabletop simulator. And um, to the point where I really don't mind playing in tabletop simulator anymore. I have well over six hour, 600 hours of games played um, there. But that being said, I am really enjoying playing games in real life. Uh, I think moving forward, I'm going to be more of a hybrid where I'm going to play most of the games in real life at different get-togethers. But I do see myself playing more games on Tabletop Simulator than I did before the pandemic started because before the pandemic started, that was essentially zero. <laughs> Um, by the way, at this point, it's been just about an hour. So um, I'm going to want to wrap this up soon. So there's still a bunch of questions. And I'm going to uh, go through those. But if you don't mind, maybe um, slow down with the questions and I'll try to get through all of these and then we can wrap this up. Um, let's see here. Pennywise says, John, what would you recommend for a first roll and write game? I'm thinking along the lines of Fleet the Dice game. Any comparisons? They all float. 
Um, <laughs> so I've not played Fleet the Dice game. All I know about it is people really like it and it's got a lot. It's got, I think has two different pieces of paper that you're working on. There's so many different things. So that makes me feel like probably not going to be the best uh, roll in a, first roll and write game that you play. Um, so off the top of my head, the first thing that I thought of was Quix. Um, no, sorry, uh, Quix is fine. It is a good roll and write game, but Quinto, that game is super solid. Um, I have enjoyed playing that one a lot. I, I made a review of that one many years ago. You can check that out if you want to see how it plays. Um, it's one of those games where you read the rules and you say, yeah, that's probably fine. And then you actually start playing it and you're like, whoa, this is like 10 times more fun than I really thought it would be. Um, other uh, introduction ones, um, Railroad Inc., is just super solid. And um, that was in interesting because um, it's still a roll and write game, but unlike many of these where you're rolling dice with numbers, in Railroad Inc, you're rolling dice that have actual tracks and routes on them that you're going to be drawing around. So they're two different experiences. So I'll go with that. Quinto and Railroad Inc are um, kind of right up there. Honestly, Quinto has even less rules and um, it's just really good. I, I, I hardly recommend that one. Uh, Jason uh, Kelm says, Hadrian's Wall is a solid flip and write if you can handle fleet. Um, yeah, Hadrian's Wall, also from the media that I've seen, I've not played it, looks like <laughs> a lot. The, the sheets that you're working with, there's a ton of stuff going on there. Uh, Truck Driving Gamer says, I just watched Slicker Drips a couple of hours ago play a roll and write about pinball, which looked quite fun. Um, I think I've heard about that one. Isn't it designed by uh, Jeffrey, uh, Jeff Engelstein? I can't remember the name of it. Super pinball something. Uh, I've not actually played it, but I've heard really good things about it, if that is what you're actually talking about. Um, and that is one that I have been interested in playing. You know, that game that I can't remember the name of. <laughs> but I don't think there's that many pinball roll and write games out there. Um, Shrey says, I ran some quick numbers and my assumption on a boom in trick takers is a bit off. It is more of a sustained increase starting in 2013 based off of my search on BoardGameGeek. Oh, that's interesting. He says, here are the counts by year from 2005 to 2020. It goes 31, 39, 35, 34, 44, 52, 58, 48, 74, 70, 89, 88, 132, 195, 98. Yeah, that seems like a pretty steady increase with a couple big jumps in there. 48 to 74 and 88 to 132 is, is pretty significant. That's definitely significant. Uh, Rajbir says, Hey John, how are Hallertau and Praga Kaput Regni holding up? I was considering getting one of these games and was curious on how they held up for you. Well, the comparison is a little bit unfair from my perspective. And the reason for that is because I played Hallertau probably six times now or so. And I played Praga Kaput Regni once and I enjoyed Praga Kaput Regni. Um, I taught it to a bunch of friends and at least one of them taught it to a bunch of their other friends playing on the official tabletop simulator mod, but I never found myself coming back to it. And I do still want to come back to it. I have a copy of it here. It is a game I'd like to play, especially in real life, touching the actual pieces. Um, but Hallertau took our board gaming group by storm. Um, it was just being played over and over and we all loved it. It's a really solid game. And the great thing about Hallertau is it looks like it's gonna be like a 90 to a minute to two hour kind of game, just a big box Uwe Rosenberg game. But we found once you play a game or two, you can finish that game in 60 minutes. In fact, there are some of my friends who have finished two player games of Hallertau in 45 minutes. Um, now that is on Tabletop Simulator with some scripting to help out with some of the calculations and whatnot, but it's it's actually a quicker and breezier game than it looks like at first. And um, I'm looking forward to playing it in real life more. So between those two, I do enjoy Hallertown more. Again, I have a lot more experience with it because I played it so many times versus the once, but that also tells you something, you know, what I've been gravitated towards. But also part of that is because the group in general liked Hallertau so much that it was often a situation where somebody says, hey, you want to play Hallertau? And then a bunch of people would join in, me being one of those people. And um, it didn't seem like people were saying, hey, do you want to play Praga Kaput Regni? Um, I will get Praga to the table again. I, I do want to make that happen. Uh, hey, Rado's here. Uh, hey, John, can't stick around, but wanted to say great job getting the chat on screen, but I'd suggest tripling the font size at least. Remember, a sizable portion of your audience is on mobile. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, honestly, I uh, started this stream, I clicked go live, and the first comment popped up on the screen, and I was just like, oh no, that's really tiny. How did I not notice that? Um, on my screen right now that I'm looking at, I have uh, OBS, which is the software I'm using, and it's not taking the entire screen. It's kind of small, so I can see a separate chat window, and I can 
barely read the text over there. And that's when I realized, yeah, this is going to be a problem, especially if somebody tries to read this on a mobile. I'm going to be increasing the size significantly. So that's that's a, a good bit of feedback there. Uh, thanks for joining in. All right. Um, let's see. Best at Star Trek says... Do I have a favorite Vital Lacerda game? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, Mercado de Lisboa is easily a favorite of mine. Um, and the second favorite is On Mars. I, I really like On Mars. I've played that one three times now. Uh, and I think it just has so many cool things going on. Um, yeah, there's a game I really like that is spiky. <laughs> like the core loop is good there, but man, lots of vestigial rules and things that, that it works. Like I'm not saying the game is bad and that the design is bad by any means. I think the design is excellent. Uh, I don't think it should be changed, but that doesn't stop the fact that it's a game with lots of, you know, different uh, subset chunks. I don't think anybody is going to be calling on Mars elegant, but, um, that one's great. Um, Mercado de Lisboa, however, is a super elegant game. Wow, that game is tight. Uh, we actually just played a, a game of that in person a few days ago. We played a four-player game, uh, and the game took like 30 minutes. Honestly, I played it at four players and three players, and I think I prefer it at three because the game is a little bit longer. The game was very short at four, but um, man, the rules are so tight in that game. That is definitely a spherical design. <laughs> I, I really can't see any bumps. Uh, just things just flow super well. It's, it's very easy to teach, and the decisions are also wonderfully complex when it actually comes to what you're trying to do and how it interacts with other people. Um, the last time I played it, I was like, hey, wait a second, this has... Has, um, uh, it, it kind of felt like a stock game uh, to a certain extent. It isn't a stock game, but because there was the idea of shared incentives, which is my favorite mechanic right now. Um, you definitely have shared incentives with the way the cards are going out and the people are going out. And yeah, that was really good. Um, Shrey says um, the game that we're talking about is Super Skill Pinball. And yes, that is the roll and write game that I would really like to try. All right. Well, it's been a little bit over an hour and I've answered all of the questions. So I think that is going to bring this to a close. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who has joined in live um, for this experiment, having the text on screen and everything. Uh, thanks for the feedback. And um, thanks to everybody else who's going to watch this in the future. Uh, once again, if you have any feedback for how this all went, I would love to hear it. And um, I will have another one of these coming out in about four or so weeks, and in the update vlog for July, which will come out at the start of the July, I'll uh, announce the exact time. So yeah, um, thanks everybody for coming by. That's going to bring this one to a close.